Good morning, church. You're allowed to, you're allowed to speak. I can't see you. <laughs> I broke my glasses in the week playing soccer, so I'm not going to preach with them on. But don't worry, I can, I can see near, I just can't see far. So you're safe today. Let us just open up in a word of prayer. Yes, Heavenly Father, may we never take for granted the special blessing it is to sing together your praise. And Lord, we just thank you for our worship team, how they led us so well. Lord, it was truly a special moment for us to sing your praises together. But Lord, as we approach your word, I ask first that, Holy Spirit, you speak through me and that you use me. And then I also ask that you work in the hearts of everyone listening and you prepare the soil for your word, for your truth. Thank you that we know that no word that comes from your mouth returns to you void. We give you all the honor and all the glory in your name. Amen. So this morning we're going to finish the book of 1 Peter. So if you've got your Bibles here, 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to do the whole uh, chapter. It's a short chapter. And just uh, a quick summary. Peter is writing to the persecuted churches. There's five of them he's writing to that's mentioned in chapter 1. And he's, he's really writing to encourage them. And what we're going to see today is we're going to start with looking at the church's leadership. Then we're going to look at the church's membership. And then we're going to just note how he finishes the letter. So let's read together from verse 1 to verse 4. This is what it says, 1 Peter 5 verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. As you'll see, this section, Peter is really looking at church leadership here. He begins by encouraging and building up the leaders of the various churches. He reminds them that he is one of them. You'll notice in verse 1 he says, as a fellow elder. Peter doesn't position himself as superior to the others, but he comes alongside. And I'll touch on that a bit more now, but a quick side note. Elder, that's been a topic in our church recently, the term and the concept elder is borrowed from the Jewish culture. It actually comes from Exodus 18, and you'll know the story of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. He comes to Moses and says, look, you can't do this on your own. Appoint trustworthy men to help govern the people in the less significant matters, and, and let them only come to you for the big, big matters. And in the New Testament, we notice a very similar type of event where the deacons begin. The deacons started because there was a need to care for widows that was falling by the wayside. And the disciples met together and said, let's appoint uh, seven men that can meet this need so that the disciples, these men, can focus on preaching. Perhaps that's where the separation of preaching from the deacons came from. But then what we notice in chapter 7 of Acts is Stephen, a deacon, preaching an expert sermon before he gets martyred. And so the point I'm actually trying to make here is that we need to be very careful 
when limiting the role of preaching and teaching simply to positions in the church. We need to remember the Great Commission is for all believers. I strongly believe that the positions and the titles given to the church, the fivefold ministry, if you want to call it that, in Ephesians 4 verse 11, it needs to be viewed as for the church, not as the church, not to be the church, but as a blessing God has intended for the church. Jesus taught us that the Sabbath is for man and not man for the Sabbath, teaching us there's a principle that we must keep the main thing the main thing. And I believe that principle applies to the positions of the church. And so I do believe that we need elders and we need deacons and we need these roles. But let us be very weary and let us be very clear that the responsibility of all believers of Jesus Christ is to proclaim the gospel. Every single one of us ought to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the positions of elders, deacons, etc., etc., are intended to bless the church, to equip the church, not hinder the church. And the only side note I want to put here is that if we miss that intention of God, let us reconsider our ways. Let us think again about what is the point of these functions. It's so that God's people may be equipped for every good work. Back to our text. That's just a side note. Elder, overseer, pastor, shepherd, these terms are all interchangeable in Scripture. If you read in your Scriptures here in verse 2, we notice overseer or oversight. We notice shepherd. And we also see elder. These are all referring to the same function, to the same position. But let's look at the attitude of Peter as a fellow elder. His attitude is one of humility, coming alongside these other elders. And if you look at scripture throughout the Gospels and so on, you'll often see Peter's name first, almost as if he was superior. But he never approaches anyone that way. And that's fascinating. That's important to note. Humility is a key character trait of Peter here in verse 1. Fighting for superiority in church leadership is foreign to Scripture. It shouldn't exist. The only thing we see in Scripture is servant leadership. There's, there should be a drive to outserve one another. And when Jesus was asked about superiority of the disciples... The mother of two disciples comes to Jesus and says, Hey Jesus, can my boys sit at your right hand? Can they have the chief seats? And Jesus replies, Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And he finishes off that, that teaching there with, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And that's very important. And that's what we see in verse 1 of Peter's attitude. He's a fellow elder. He's witnessed the sufferings of Christ. He's been a partaker of the glory to be revealed. But he does not lord that over these elders. He says, I am one of you. I am alongside you. And this is the humility Peter has when he brings this encouragement to the leaders of the church. And what are the leaders encouraged to do? That's what we see from verse 2 and 3. So what should leadership of the church look like? What is the function of our leaders? First off, we see in verse 2, the, the, they are encouraged to shepherd the flock. The King James Version translates shepherd as feed, but I think shepherd is probably the better translation. But regardless of that, the picture that Peter's painting for church leadership is a shepherd. And what does a shepherd do for the sheep? The shepherd leads, the shepherd feeds, and the shepherd protects. These are the functions of a shepherd for the sheep. But what's interesting is the word pastor is the same word as shepherd. It comes from the same Greek word. So when you, you, if you read your 
Bible, you might not see pastor in there, but every time you see shepherd, it means pastor. That's where the word pastor comes from. But what we see, what follows next is Peter sort of explains what he means by shepherd the flock. And, and I've identified three things here. He has a negative and then a positive, a negative and then a positive. And we're going to quickly look at that because this is the description of biblical church leadership. And the first one we see is exercising oversight. That is an action. And this is actually where the word overseer comes from. So elder is borrowed from Jewish culture, but overseer is borrowed from the Greek culture. And you can sort of see how the Bible grabs these two terms to say we are one. There is this role of leadership that is required. And so the job of leaders of the church is to oversee or to watch over. As a shepherd watches over the sheep is the picture being painted for us, which means the shepherd should lead the flock to green pasture, should ensure their safety, and should keep the sheep from wandering too far off. What I like most about this picture when I was on the farm 2011 to 2013, 14, I'd always noticed the shepherds going out with the cattle. And what struck me was the shepherd is with the sheep. The pastor should be with the flock, not above, not superior to, but in the presence of. And I just thought that a pretty picture. But the idea of oversight does imply a certain level of authority. It does imply that there's someone in charge of the organization. But again, I cannot stress it enough. Verse 1, we highlighted the humility of Peter. That's part of what's required of leadership. And you're going to see it does get a lot stricter on leadership now now. But the, the concept of oversight is just watching over and making sure that the work is done correctly. And so there's that very real sense of leadership over other believers. But now what follows is the characteristics. And we notice the first one is not under compulsion, the negative, but willingly. Peter says not under compulsion, but willingly. We cannot force people to lead in the church. We do not, and we should not, go around saying things like this. Don't you think it's, you've been here long enough, it's time to serve? That's under compulsion. That's a guilt trip. We shouldn't go around saying things like, well, you know, since you are such a wonderful accountant, shouldn't you do finances for the church? That's under compulsion. You see, a character trait of church leadership is there has to be a volunteer heart, a willingness to do it. We cannot and we should not guilt or force people to serve in leadership roles in the church. And so a key characteristic is this willingness. And so I want to say it very clearly, it might sound a bit strange coming from the pulpit, but if you are tired of serving, then stop. If you are tired of serving, stop. Willingness is a key character trait of not only leadership, but of the very nature of our faith. Faith cannot be forced. God and his church do not force participation. Now, I also have to just make, my, make it clear now. I'm not saying that when serving gets difficult, quit. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that God does not want you to serve. But what I am emphasizing, what I am trying to make very clear is that service in the kingdom of God is on a voluntary basis. God does not require mercenaries in his church. God only requires those who love him with all their hearts, with all their minds, and with all their souls. That is the heart, that is the key of willingness. 
The next thing that Peter points out is not for shameful gain, but eagerly. The King James Version translates eagerly, eagerly as of a ready mind. And I like that translation. And so I emphasize again, God does not require mercenaries in his church. He doesn't need those who are in it for a payout. The payout is not only financial. There are other forms of a payout. But what scripture is teaching especially in this concept of eagerness or of a ready mind, is that the, mo the mindset, the motive, is right. Scripture also teaches that a preacher should be paid. So it's not saying preachers must go without a salary, but what it is saying here is that the heart of the pastor, the heart of the church leadership, the heart of those who serve, should not be on money either the lack of it or the excess of it. But the focus of church leadership should always be on shepherding the flock of God. That is the heart. That's where it starts in verse 2, shepherd the flock. The focus, the motive, the driving force is on shepherding, not what you get out. And that's why I like the King James Version where it says of a ready mind, because it means ready regardless of pay or no pay, regardless of challenge or ease, but a willingness, an eagerness to focus on the flock of God. And uh, he goes now on to the next one and he says, not domineering over them in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Perhaps this is the most important one. Christian biblical leadership is the leadership of example. We see that again and again throughout scripture. Christian biblical leadership is not based on skill set. It is not based on popular opinion. It's not even based off performance. You can have the most successful organization, but that's not biblical leadership. Biblical leadership, as given here, is found, the foundation of biblical leadership is in how you conduct yourself day by day. Christian leadership is based upon the witness of your lifestyle. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is where Paul writes to Timothy, and we all know it, it says, let no one despise you for your youth. And straight after that, Paul says, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. That is the heart of setting the example. That is the foundation of Christian biblical leadership, the setting the example. The, the role of church leadership is not to solve your problems. The role of church leadership is not to tell you how to live. The role of church leadership is to point you to Jesus. We see in verse 4, that's where it comes to, and the chief shepherd. I am an under-shepherd. The chief shepherd is the one who cares for you. And we're going to see that later as well. So church leadership, the, the function of church leadership is simply to make sure that you as the members are turning to Jesus in your time of need and in your time of plenty. My role is to oversee that you are growing closer to Jesus, not ticking boxes. I have the license from God's word to rebuke, to exhort, to reproof, to correct, to train, etc. The flock of God at Centurion Baptist Church, I have that right. However, as we see in our text this morning, so much more important is that I have the instruction to make sure I do that, not as a dictator, but by example. That is not domineering but being examples. Church leadership is not about 
a strong arm to tell you what to do. So, but I say, follow me as I follow Christ, in the words of Paul. I think the King James Version translates verse 3 particularly wonderfully. And it says, neither is being lords, so instead of domineering, it says, neither is being lords, but it adds this phrase in the King James Version, over God's heritage. And I love that. I love the way it expresses that, because verse 4 continues that thought with the chief shepherd. Because what we need to understand is that the overwhelming message Peter's making here is that church leadership is a role of stewardship of what belongs to God. And what God is saying here very clearly is that it is not my church, it's his church. It's not my flock, it's his flock. And what God is saying, he's saying that you as the members are his heritage. He's saying you are his prized possession, his bride, his sheep. Church, this morning I hope you hear the love of the Father for you in these verses. But what God is doing is he's warning leadership. It's a very clear warning for leadership that if we are heavy-handed with the congregation, if we are careless in leading his people, he will hold us accountable. You see, the congregation members should love these verses because it's... God is sort of saying, you're mine, I love you. And leadership should be very somber and careful when reading these verses. Because God is saying, they are mine, I love them. And what we see in verse 4 is that leadership is something God values. There's a reward given to specifically those in leadership. So God does reward all believers. It's not that we are better than, but it's that that concept of we are held doubly accountable. And so there's that a little bit of a reward for the extra danger, I suppose, we put ourselves in. And this is also why those who join ministry or those who go into leadership in a church should really have a call from God because that's the only thing that makes it worthwhile. It's the only thing that weathers you and keeps you in every storm you face. But let us continue. So we've looked at leadership now. We've seen that leaders need to be willing, they need to be eager or of a ready mind, and they need to set the example. Now Peter shifts his focus to the congregation, to the members. Let's read from verse 5 to 11. And this is what verse 5 says. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful piece of scripture this is. I love it. Peter addresses the church membership here, and he he starts off quite strong, and it ties in with leadership. It starts off where he addresses them, and he says, the membership should submit to the leadership. It's quite a strong start by Peter. The phrase, you are younger, does not disqualify 
the older people. But it is perhaps a reference, and we know it from our own experience, that younger people are just a little bit more likely to be like, but why should I listen? But a little bit more likely to be rebellious in that sense. And so that phrase, you are, you who are younger, is referring to a more particular area of focus, almost as especially the younger people. But that does not disqualify the rest of the congregation. The term elder there is the same term earlier, so it's referring to church leadership, not to the advancement in years. I want to just clarify that when God tells us to be subject to church leadership, it's not without refrain. It's not all church leadership simply because of their title. God is referring here to good, godly leadership. Because remember, you are told elsewhere in Scripture to test what people say by the Word of God. So this isn't a, a blanket statement where you do what I say, but if what I've said is in good, godly counsel, then you listen. That's the picture Peter's saying. It is not what we see often in the charismatic movement where people follow without thought or follow without thinking or reading or turning to God themselves. Remember, and that's one of the beauties of our Baptist heritage, is that each one of you is a priest. Each one of you has direct access to God. Each one of you is a leader in that sense. And so keep that in mind, but this is talking about submitting to church leadership. The message of verse 5 is actually very clear, and I, the King James Version again, perhaps because I had to memorize it as a student at CCS, but <laughs> verse 5 in the King James says, it, 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 the, same, the beginning is the same, likewise ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder. But then afterwards, in the King James, it says, yeah. Almost like a yeah, all of you. That's how, it, how it's captured in the King James Version. And it's that emphasis of submitting to one another. So Peter starts by saying submit to church leadership, but he follows it straight up by saying, remember as, as a Christian community, as believers of the living God, our duty, our responsibility is to specialize in service to each other, in submissiveness to one another, not just to leadership. And it's this submission that we ought to be experts at as believers. And this submission requires humility. And that's what we see Peter follows up straight after that. He says, submit all of you to one another with humility. Oftentimes, a lack of submission is the presence of pride. Pride is, by definition, the overestimation of yourself. Oftentimes, not wanting to submit is the presence of pride. We have statements like, but I'm not wrong, why should I submit? We have statements like, but who does he think he is? And I've mentioned this previously, and I have to quote Paul in Corinthians, and I ask him the same, I ask the same question Paul asks in 1 Corinthians 6. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather just take it on the chin for the sake of your brother, whether you're right or not? What's the goal? What's the point? And that's the idea of the submission here, and this humility toward one another is because, and Peter says it here, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. What I like is that he follows up in verse 6 and he says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. God exalt his people for his glory and he's mighty to do so. He's capable. Do you trust him? 
But Paul continues, and this is probably from verse 7, it gets so encouraging. From verse 7 onwards, it's probably, you know, it's these verses we can memorize and hold on to. Do you have concerns? Do you have cares? Do you have worries, anxieties, anxious thoughts, things like this? Well, then hear what God says to you this morning very clearly in his word. God says to you from verse 7, cast all your anxieties on me, all of them. I care for you. It's the word of God to you this morning. God loves you. God cares about you. God cares for you. It is just that simple. It's not complicated. Do you have any concern? Something bothering you? Give it to God. He's asking you. He, there, verse 7 is very clear. But then what's interesting is verse 8 is based off verse 7. Most people don't realize that. God cares for you. God loves you. He does not want you to put yourself in harm's way. That's why it says in verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, be vigilant, be alert, pay attention to the voice of God and the word of God. Why? Because you have an enemy. You've got someone out there who wants to do you harm. And I don't think I can preach about this enough, but sober-minded is probably one of my favorite words. It means not given to extremes. You see, many churches... As a church, we have to be on guard against many things. We have to be on guard against false teaching, against divisions, against... That list gets long. We've got to be on guard on many things. But one of the things that the modern church is not on guard against is feelings, emotions. Sober-minded means not given to extremes. And if you think of your own life, if you think of things you've gone through, the quickest way to lose clarity of thought is to be overwhelmed by emotions. Quickest way to lose the clarity of thoughts is when emotions just, they rise up. And they do. And so what Peter is saying here is be sober-minded and watchful. What that's talking about is discipline. What that's talking about is careful diligence. Spending time with God's word regularly. Worshipping God in the way you live. Praying without ceasing. These are the discipline actions of our faith. These are the things that you do even when you don't feel like it. That's what's, what contributes to sober-mindedness. Now, this does not mean that one cannot enjoy singing and praising, worshiping God in song and music. It's wonderful. I mean, just this morning, I was, it really was a special time for me personally in worship. I just... I don't know, maybe it's because I could hear most of you sing. It was just, it was special for me. It's not saying that's not important. It's just saying you can't build on that foundation. It's just saying that foundation is shallow for when the storms come. It doesn't mean that you cannot enjoy and love praying. I, know, I knew a man on the farm, he would pray to God for eight hours in a day easily. You just walk and you just pray and lose track of responsibility and time. And that's wonderful. I'm glad you could do that. But it's not saying that's not good or not important. It's just saying you've got to build yourself on something more secure. You've got to build your life on something that has more rock to it, if I can use that word. One cannot hope to resist a roaring lion unless one is equipped in the full armor of God. It's quite simple, really. You notice how in verse 9, Peter says, resist the enemy, but then he follows that up with firm. There's the word firm in your faith. Now, let's look at the believers he's writing to. These are believers who are suffering severe persecution. These believers can feel the very breath of this lion on their face. They are seeing their loved ones, the people they know personally, being killed and wiped out, dragged away, beaten. Death and destruction of all that they believe in is happening in front of their very eyes. I don't know if you guys know the Michael W. song, This Is How I Fight My Battles. It's quite repetitive. It's, it's a good song. But these believers didn't have that song. They couldn't be like, this is how I fight my battles. 
They didn't have these things that promote the Christian feeling that the modern church relies so heavily upon. What's more is that these believers, these persecuted believers, they didn't even have resurrection miracles. It's not like the people being led away, beaten, killed for their faith were being resurrected. What do we do in the face of a lion that is wiping out, in a very real sense for these believers, family members? And this is where Peter says, firm in your faith. And this is what I want to highlight to you. I'm not saying these other things that produce good feelings are bad, but what I'm saying is that faith in the gospel is enough. You don't need more. You don't need more. What is faith? Faith is an unwavering trust. What is, what is Peter saying to these persecuted believers? He is saying the God of all grace. Our God, the living God. Put your faith in him. That is enough. Resist the devil. Firm in your faith. Then he acknowledges their suffering. He says, no, I understand. It's Know that your suffering is real. And other believers around the world are experiencing the same thing. But when you have suffered a little while, and this helps us have firm faith, we need to understand that Peter is comparing their suffering to their eternity. He's not promising them an out. He's not saying, you know, if you trust hard enough, you'll avoid disease and persecution. He's saying, the God of all grace, this God who's called you to eternal glory in Christ, verse 10. Faith in him is enough to weather every storm. Faith in the living God is enough for every difficult situation. Faith is enough. Church, this morning, be encouraged to have faith. Place your complete faith, your complete trust in Jesus Christ. Be firm in your faith. What Peter does is he reminds these believers that they are not alone. You all know which soccer team I support. You are not alone. Much more importantly, we have a community of believers that is universal. We have a community of believers, the true believers of Jesus Christ is universal. You are not alone. Have faith in God. But let's look at verse 10. It's just such a beautiful verse. And I, I strongly believe this is one of the verses we can really memorize and hold on to in tough times. And it, it says this, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Peter is saying, Hey, believers, you will suffer. However, by comparison to your restoration, the suffering will be for such a short time. We are sure that we will suffer. 2 Timothy says, For all who seek to live a godly life will face persecution. It's at the end scripture, you're going to suffer. But what we also know is that our suffering will be short. By comparison to the eternal glory Christ has called us into. We are sure that we will suffer, but we are sure that after suffering, the God of all grace, Peter says, our God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. Again, I'm going to go to the King James Version. <laughs> the King James Version puts it this way. The God of all grace will make you perfect, 
establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. If you've come to church this morning anxious and unsettled, know that this suffering is temporary and that God says he will personally restore you. Doesn't that cause you to praise Jesus? Doesn't that cause in your spirit to to bubble up and be like, glory and dominion, honor and power be unto our God. And that's where Peter finishes in verse 11, to him, to Christ, to God the Father, be the dominion forever and ever. May we know that even though we face and feel the breath of a lion, We know that our God is mighty to restore, our God is mighty to heal, our God is mighty to raise up his people. Let us always praise the only and the living God, Jesus Christ. Let us turn to the last, the conclusion, how Peter ends this. The last three verses from verse 12 reads, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a holy kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And so what we see here is Paul ends the letter in in pretty much the standard convention that would end the letters of that time period. Sylvanus is most likely either the carrier of the letter or the person who wrote what Peter dictated. And what's interesting is we see the reference to Babylon here, which is most likely a reference to the church, likewise chosen, referring to the people of God, and then Babylon most likely representing the Roman Empire at this time. So most likely he's referring to the church in Rome. And then we also notice Mark as a partner. And what I want to point out to you is that whenever you read the letters, these conclusions actually give you some wonderful information, something we learn from this, and it's important for our church, is that the apostles, the disciples, the elders never operated in isolation. It's not Peter, full stop, sign. It's not Paul, full stop. Any of the letters, you'll notice it's a team, it's a group, it's more than one, and I find that fascinating. So Peter, Sylvanus, and Mark, it's probably a team that are working together, and this testifies to the unity of God's people and how it should be. We notice the kiss of love. Please don't kiss me as you leave. I don't appreciate it. But this was a form of greeting during that time period, and it still is a form of greeting for many different cultures. And what this is actually highlighting is hospitality and welcome. It's not talking about kissing. It's talking about opening up the doors of your heart to everyone who is a believer in Christ. And so the highlights in this conclusion is Peter reminds us, stand firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, stand firm in it. The true grace of God. And then he says to extend hospitality and welcome to all who are in Christ Jesus. You'll see peace to all of you who are in Christ. And that's very much our prayer always. It's not about which church you belong to. It's not our church. It's his church. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we conclude 1 Peter, there's so much encouragement here. And Father, you've called us to be one family here at Centurion Baptist Church. And I feel that, Lord. I feel that when everyone bakes a meal, comes to church with a smile. I thank you for my family here at Centurion Baptist Church. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you help us to grow closer and closer and closer together in your love, equipping us for every good work. Lord, I ask that you give us a special grace to serve one another. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. We'll sing one song and then I'll close with a benediction. 
and the benediction I'm reading from Romans. And this is our prayer over you as God's people. Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, you are more than conquerors through him who has loved you. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.